Revelations chapter 3 and reading verse 22. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. Now, everybody thought we'd be out of Revelations now, particularly chapters 2 and 3. But we finish the seven churches, but we begin to think about what was the purpose of these seven letters to the seven churches. If God had only wanted these messages to go to these individual churches, they would not have been included in the Bible. I mean, if it was just for the purpose so that these seven churches would make the changes they needed to make, it wouldn't have been beneficial for us to read the churches, to read the seven letters to the churches. Um, but the purpose was to correct issues in the seven churches, but they're relevant for our lives as well. One of the things that we hear often today is <clears throat> the Bible's not relevant any longer. You know, it's, uh, it, it's old-fashioned, it's outdated, and it doesn't apply to modern times. But those statements are about as false as you can get on any statement that you make. The Bible is just as relevant today as it was to these seven churches when these letters were written and wrote uh, and uh, read uh, to each one of them. Amen. It applies to our life very simple. The purpose that God desired for these churches, and He made mention of it to each of the seven churches. You know, I thought about when it said, let he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Many times in life today, we hear things and it passes through one ear and out the other. It does, we don't apply it to our lives. We don't take it to heart. And God was not specifically when He read that. And of course, uh, we could have read that different, seven different times. He stated in there, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. He wasn't necessarily saying even though they needed to hear the letters that was written to each church. They needed to hear the words that God had towards them. But he was more speaking about what the Spirit was speaking to their hearts. And that's what we need to hear today. When we hear the Word of God, whether, it's, whether we're reading the Word or whether it's being preached or being taught, we need to hear more with our heart and not just with our ears. When, when we can receive the Word, we can receive it into our mind and, and we can memorize it, but that Word doesn't do us any good unless we get it down in our hearts and live by it. And that's what He was saying. And, and He spoke to the church. God's desire for every church, and we're going to look at the messages again to each one of those churches. The message was that God wanted each one of those churches to be overcomers, to overcome the things of the world, to overcome the problems of the world, to overcome the shortcomings and the weaknesses and the failures that they had. God wanted each one of these churches to be victorious in, in their uh, witness and in their lives. Amen. Now we're going to look this morning again at the words that he spoke to these seven churches. The first church that he addressed was the church at Edifice. It was the church that had left their first love. And notice what he said. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Who is receiving this? The ones that overcome. The lesson here that he teaches is that truth and love must go hand in hand. A church that upholds doctrine at the expense of loving one another is wasting their time. 
The church that shows love to everybody, concern for everybody, reaches out to everybody, but doesn't worry about doctrine is wasting their time as well. We've got to have truth. We've got to follow God's Word. And we've got to do it in love. You know, we can, we can preach the Word and condemn people, and that's not going to set them free. Condemnation does not set people free. We've got to love them when we speak the truth. Speak the truth in love. And that's what He wanted this church to understand. To the second church, the church that remained faithful among persecution was the church at Smyrna. And He said to them, He said, He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Again, it was the overcomers that were going to be protected by the second death. The church at Smyrna, Christians today, are persecuted worldwide in, in very uh, different ways. In America, we're very fortunate. Our, our persecution is mostly just some minor ridicule. But there are nations around the world where if you go, are caught in public with a Bible, you'll be executed or you'll be put in prison. There are people around the world who cannot openly proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life without fear of death. And so he wants to understand that we may go through persecution, but and he told them that the persecution would be short-lived. And, and you know, you think about it, we go through times, and, and like I say, we're blessed in our country. But think about a nation, a man that would live 50, 60, 70, 80 years and maybe as a young child accepted the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and, and received Christ as Lord and Savior of his life and had to live 60 or 70 or 80 years under this persecution and with this fear of, of if he lets anybody know who he believes in, he's going to be put to death. That would be torment to not be able to tell anybody about Jesus. And then Jesus sends you a letter and says, your persecution is just going to be short-lived. I've lived like this for 60, 70 years. What do you mean short-lived? Compare 60 or 70 years to all of eternity. Amen. It's a short period of time. It may seem like a long period of time, but it's just a short period. Period. Then there was the church at Pergamon. The church that had compromised its beliefs. To him who overcomes, I will give some hidden manna to eat. I will give him a white stone. And on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who received it. It's, it's easy to look at a non-Christian's life and think, you know, they'll just go along with anything. But so often within the church, the church has wanted to compromise. So many churches have compromised with the world Amen. to attract the crowd, right. to attract people coming in. We, we'd rather compromise a little bit on the Word of God than, than lose members in the church. Right. God says, if you want to overcome, you can't compromise. You've got to conform to the Word of God, Amen. not to the world. Romans chapter 12 says, be, conformed, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Don't be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our mind? With the Word of God. We're to let the mind of Christ be in us. And then he said <clears throat> to the church at Thyatira, the church that was following these false prophets, he said, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. 
He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. As I also have received from my Father, I will give him the morning star. The church at Thyatira was led astray by these false prophets. Christians today, you know, we, we can think of names. David Koresh comes to mind real quick. Uh, there's a lot of prophets that we've seen in our lifetime that have led people astray. That have They, they may have came in and, and, and so often preachers come in and they preach bits and pieces of the truth to attract people and get people in. And then they begin to sway from the truth. They tell people things that they want to hear. I can tell you exactly how to get to heaven. Here's what the list of things you need to do. And many people are won over by that because they want to know what they can do to earn their way into the kingdom of God. And we can't earn our way in. What we do is we accept what Jesus Christ did for us upon Calvary's cross. And then we live a life for Him, pleasing unto Him. Then the next church was the church at Sardis. This was the church that was spiritually dead. They had a name that they were alive, but Jesus said, you're dead. He said, to him who overcomes, you'll be clothed in white garments. And I will blot out his name from the book of life. I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. Christians could easily fall into a trap and be ensnared as the church of Sardis was if we merely go through the motions. You know, a lot of people, uh, they, they will show up to church every Sunday. They never miss a, a church. Faithfulness to church is of the utmost importance. But they're simply going through a ritual. They're not coming to church to, to worship God. They're not coming to church to learn more about Him and to learn how to live a life more pleasing to Him. They're just simply going through the motions of showing up to church. We get up every morning and we read a few passages of Scripture. Not to learn more about God, but to say, I've read the Word. I have did what I'm supposed to do. And now I can live my life the way I want to live it. It's easy to fall into those ruts. That was the church that was spiritually dead because they were going through the motions. Are we going through the motions or are we living for God? The next church was the church of Philadelphia. The church that, again, there was no rebuke to, but the, the church was uh, uh, dealing with, they, they were weak. They were a small church. They were a small group. And, and maybe becoming discouraged, we don't know. But there was no rebuke to this church. But he said, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. I will make him a pillow in the church of God. Now, we, we don't think too much about that word pillow because we think of like a cushion that we see around us here. But he's talking about something that's a pillow that, that goes up that strengthens, that holds up a, a pillar in a, a building like a, a collar. Something that adds strength. He was telling this church because this was the church that was founded on love. This was the church that was loving one another as they should have been. He said, I'll make you that which strengthens the temple of my God. And then, of course, the last church, seventh church. In a sense, the worst was saved for last, but it may have been the best. Listen to what he says. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father 
on His throne. The church at Laodicea, the church that Jesus, when He wrote a letter, when He sent the message, had absolutely nothing good to say about this church. He said to you, if you overcome, and remember what He told me. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door and invite me to come in, I'll sup with him and he with me. He said, I'm going to allow you to sit on my throne. Because I overcame and my Father granted that right into me. To be able to sit on the throne. It's easy as the church at Laodicea. It's easy in life to come complacent. You know, nobody wants to go through persecution. Nobody wants to go through trials. But we need trials and we need persecution to keep us in line with God. We need persecution to keep us trusting in God. Because when nothing ever goes wrong, we become complacent where we're at. We become content. We become satisfied. And as a born-again believer, we should never be satisfied with where we're at. If we're not on a level with Jesus Christ, we've got room to grow. And unfortunately, from the pulpit to the back pew, there's not a one of us here this morning that can say, I'm on the same level with Jesus. Remember Paul. Think about Paul. The Apostle Paul. The, the man that he was. The, the man that, that went about preaching God's Word. That, that was shipwrecked. That was beaten. That was in prison. That everything that could possibly go wrong to a person went wrong in Paul's life. And Paul said, I have not yet obtained. Amen. I'm striving. I'm reaching forth. Trying to reach the mark. Of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what I'm striving for. I haven't got there yet. But I'm still trying to reach up to that mark. Amen. Are we trying to reach up to that mark? Are we striving to be the best that we can possibly be in Christ? Or like the church at Laodicea. Have we become satisfied, content with where we're at? I don't need to grow any closer because I'm as close as I want to be. That's where many people are at today. We just don't want to get any closer because, you know, if I get closer, God might require a little bit more out of me. To each one of the seven churches, He gave the message, to Him who overcomes, an overcomer is a conqueror. One that subdues in battle over the enemy. We need to realize in life that we have an enemy. Many people have forgotten there is an enemy out there to the Christian. You know, I, I, I thought about last night as I, I watched the news and, and watched. I, I thought about President or uh, former President Trump when, when he was shot. I thought about in, in all the things that he does and in the, the campaigning and going to these uh, different venues that set up. I often wonder if he ever thought about someone attempting to take his life. It, it, or had he become confident in the Secret Service and in the, the, the law enforcement around him? And just maybe believe that it couldn't happen. It wouldn't take place. I, I, I don't know. But as Christians, we need to realize that we have an enemy in the world. Amen. We have someone trying to destroy our lives. Peter said this. He said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I, I like that in, in the New Living Translation. It says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We have to realize that we have an enemy. We have to recognize who the enemy is. I've told you before. 
story, there was a, a, a scorpion. He was sitting on a rock and he fell asleep. And he woke up and there was water all around him. Tide came in. And he began to yell out for help and a sea turtle came swimming by. And he hollered at the turtle and he said, come over here and rescue me. He said, uh, it, when the tide is high tide, the rock's going to com be completely covered and I'll drown because scorpions can't swim. And the turtle said, no, I can't rescue you because you're my enemy. And you'll sting me and I'll die. And the scorpion said, why would I do that? If I'm on your back riding to safety, I won't sting you because you're going to rescue me. You're going to take me over to the shore. Then the turtle thought, well, that kind of makes sense. Well, you know, if he stings me and I die, both of us are going to drown. So the turtle swims over to the rock. The scorpion gets on his back on the shell. And they begin towards the shore. The scorpion turns around and reaches up and stings him on the neck. And the turtle said, now we're both going to die. Why would you do that? And the scorpion said, you knew what I was before you ever let me on your back. Right. We've got to be careful with the enemy. The enemy is out to destroy us. Jesus tells us, John chapter 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd. He talks about how the sheep recognize his voice. How we, 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 we won't listen to another one. But he says, listen, the thief comes not except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I've come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. He comes to give us a good life. The enemy comes to steal that life from us. God's desire for our life is that we become overcomers and live this abundant life that the Good Shepherd came and gave us. We have to decide if we want to live a victorious life or we want to live a defeated life. In Deuteronomy, God lays out the blessings of Israel. He, he tells Israel how He's going to bless them and what all He's going to do for them and, and how how He's going to give them everything they need in life. But He puts a condition on it. He says, if you will diligently hear My voice and obey My voice and observe all the commandments that I give you, He said, then I'm going to bless you. Mr. Webster says, diligently means with steady application and care. Not carelessly, or not negligently? Do we carefully, diligently apply God's Word to our lives? God told him, He said, I'm going to bless you in the city. I'm going to bless you in the country. I'm going to bless you wherever you go. He said, I'm going to bless your goods. I'm going to bless your, the, the fruit of your uh, loins. He said, I'm going to bless the fruit of your gardens. He said, I'm going to bless you in every way possible. And he said, here's what I want for you. He said, I want to make you the head and not the tail. He said, I want to make you always to be above and not beneath. I want you to heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And I want you to be careful to observe them so that you will not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to the right or to the left and not to go after other gods and to serve them. God wants to bless us. God wants us to become overcomers. But it's a choice we make whether we overcome or not. It's obedience to His Word. Why did He write the seven letters to the seven churches? Well, each of the seven churches were struggling at that time with some issue that was not pleasing to God. Maybe Philadelphia wasn't really struggling, but I think they had, it sounded to me like they were kind of becoming discouraged because they were so small and so weak. And God told them to hang on. God's desire for every church, for every individual in every church, is to be successful. God wants you to be victorious. God wants you to become an overcomer 
But we have to remember that success, being victorious, is being victorious in God's eyes is different from being victorious in the world's eyes. The world says, if you've got a large bank account, you're pretty successful. If you've got a bunch of toys, you know, the old saying is, he who, who has the most toys wins. There's another one that says, he who has the most toys still dies in the end. What we possess in this life, in physical possessions, doesn't measure our success. God measures success by His Word. I, 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 when I was preparing the message, I thought about the woman, uh, the, the widow woman who came and, and gave at the offering. I often wondered why Jesus and the disciples were standing there, but they were standing out when people were coming into the temple putting their money into the plate. Like, I stand back there and watch, see how much you put. No, I don't watch how much you put. In. <laughs> but they were standing there, and this widow woman came in, and she dropped in two months. And Jesus said, did you see what she put in? And the disciples didn't say anything, but I can imagine what they were thinking. Two mites. Why did she bother? She might as well have just stayed home. A mite is less than one third of a cent. So she put in less than a penny. And then Jesus kind of blew their mind. He said, did you see what that woman put in? She put in more than everybody else. Disciples probably thought he was crazy. What? She dropped in two mites. And Jesus said, everybody else that's come by has put in out of their abundance. They, they put in what they had left over after they had spent everything and bought everything and done everything they wanted to do. If they had something left over, they dropped it in the plate. <clears throat> this woman gave of her living. She gave all that she had. That's God's desire for obedience. Is that we give all that we have. And we're not talking about money. We're talking about our lives. <laughs> He's fine, Tony. God's desire. Is obedience to his life. Obedience to his word in our lives. If we have a desire to become an overcomer. To be successful. To be victorious in this life. We have to be willing to give all to him. The purpose of the seven letters. Was as much for our benefit today. As they were for these seven churches. In the book of Revelation. God wants you and I to be successful. He wants us to be victorious. He wants us to be overcomers in life. To receive all that He promised to these seven churches. Especially to the church at Laodicea. To be able to sit on His throne with Him. We have to be willing to be obedient to His call. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you this morning for the privilege and honor to come and to share your word. And Father, we pray this morning as we have read your word. And Father, we realize that we must be overcomers. We have to overcome the things of the world. Father, we pray this morning that you speak to each heart. Help us to, to Father, to strive to reach that mark that Jesus Christ set before us. That mark of the high calling. Father, may we examine our hearts and our lives. 
and be who you would want us to be that we might live a life that's pleasing to you that when we come to the end of this journey that we will be known as overcomers and receive all that you have for us in glory minister again father we pray to every need that's represented here today every need that's been spoken forth needs upon hearts that were not respoken and father we pray father god that we'll each yield ourselves to the leadership of the holy spirit and give you free reign in the service and in our lives all this we ask in jesus name amen I ask you to stand with me this morning as always as we close and we close with a song.